speaker tonight is Greg Schultz. He, okay, thank you. Um, yes, Greg's a collector from Ohio. He's been involved in philately for quite a while, and he found his niche. He's uh, one of the leading experts in the Washington Franklin coil issues. I know a lot of people collect Washington Franklins as part of a U.S. collection. Jerry's a big Washington Franklin collector. It's one of his, his uh, focuses. And uh, Greg's been a very successful exhibitor. He's won numerous single frame grand awards and, and um, reserve grand awards and a lot of awards the last few years. And he, uh, he's a leading expert in this area. It's a very technical area. There is so much interesting information that's still being gleaned out of this because when these stamps were issued, the, the post office didn't have first days for all of them. They just shoved them out there and put them out. They were changing paper. They were changing perforations. They were doing lots of things. So it makes it very fascinating. So Greg, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, I guess this is now when I share the screen. Yep, just go down to the thing, green thing and share screen. Here we go. There we are, all right. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone tonight. Um, just a little background, I've probably been collecting the issues for over 30 years and been involved in exhibiting probably 16 to 17 years now. And um, as you say, there were a lot of things that the Bureau did as far as issuing these stamps. None of them were really announced, as you said. Uh, so that led to a lot of different varieties and things that could be found. And there's still new discoveries that are being made today, even though some of the issues are over 100 years old. So. Why is it not gone? There we go. So tonight, I'll talk a little about the history and development. Second part will be about the different issues and hopefully we have time, we'll do some questions and answers. Here's our history and development. The actual first coil stamp ever produced was by Peru back in 1862. They were probably 40 some years before the other countries such as the United States and a few others that got involved in doing this. So the US was one of several countries they experimented with and developed the coil stamps around the turn of the century. The interest in vending machines and their development saw a number of countries such as New Zealand and the Netherlands experiment with stamps used in vending machines. England followed suit with their version of coils. They took sheet stamps, trimmed them, pasted them together to form coils. In the United States, we took it a step further. We developed the coil production using imperforate sheets that they were perforated, stripped, and constructed into the first true coil stamps used in venting and affixing machines. This led to further development and producing coils and the rotary press machine. The new machine created interest from several more countries, which took up the production of coils as well. The thing that really can be attributed to this is that during the Industrial Revolution, Late 1800s, the early 1900s was a period of tremendous growth. Wide variety of venting and fixing machines were invented. Anything from postcards to gumballs could be dispensed. The stamp business provided an opportunity. So did government contracts. There were many vending machine companies. The government issued a request for vending machines to sell coil stamps in the post offices. Several companies submitted machines for the vending, mach vending coil stamps. Four of the machines dispensed vertical coils, the remaining three used horizontal. This was one of the vertical machines that were accepted by Leighton Parkhurst. This is actually a copy of his patent showing the outside design of the vending machine. This is kind of the internal works, uh, a lot of stuff going on there. They advertised for people to buy shares in the company And this was an example that was a discovery from a, a dealer that I found at a show a number of years back. It was what looked like a rare experimental coil. Uh, when the dealer showed it to me, he said, what do you think of that? And I go, that's probably an item that's worth 
six figures if it's real. And then he proceeded to tell me that it wasn't. And I said, well, it's a neat conversation piece. So he said, well, give me 10 bucks for it. So I did. Then a few years later, took it to show and showed it to Lewis Kaufman. And he asked to have it expertized. Well, they found that it was a experimental version that was developed by Leighton Parkhurst and put through the machine. And they ended up giving it a good certificate for the experimental version. It was not the rare 316 vertical coil, but still it was interesting variety. The machine actually shows how it was dispensed, perforated, and it would cut off the stamp and apply it to the envelope or postcard. This was a vertical coil with the same vending machine marks that uh, was actually used to verify my as well as the other person's. This is the new discovery that I've made and this kind of shows at the very top of the enlargement the four indentations that are like the advancing, advancing pins that are in the machine that move the coil roll forward. This actually happens to be an example that was sent from Chicago. Uh, it's actually one of the first bureau coils from uh, the first issues. This is actually in the process of being expertized to see whether or not they accepted it as a Parkhurst vending machine application. The first government issued coils were experimental. They were all constructed by hand and they were made from individual strips of 10 pasted together. <coughs> there, it was a very time consuming process and most all of these have a distinct color and are extremely rare. This is one of the few known examples on cover. This was actually in the Bill Gross collection that was sold at auction recently. And I think the price realized over $265,000. This is one of the first affixers that were used to dispense and apply coil stamps. For the third bureau flat plate coils, they were issued over approximately a seven year period. Uh, I found 47 different flat plate coil varieties. This includes imperforate and perforated examples that were issued by the bureau. And as Tim alluded to, they changed perforations, they changed watermark, they changed the design type, and they also changed the plate layout. The first coils were not well received. As you think about the sheet stamps that were produced back then, all sheets had a straight edge around the outside and those are not usually what people like. They don't like to collect them. And when coils came out, they were even less appealing because they had two straight edges. So many of the first issues were not saved by collectors. These were the different types of plates that were used over the course of the flat plate production era. For the different flat plate coil issues in 1908, the imperforate stamps were 343 to 347. Then we have the perforated gauge 12. We also have in 1910, another set of imperforate and perforated gauge 12. Basically the big difference here was they changed the watermark from, single line, from double line to single line. And then in 1910, they changed the perforation gauge again 1912, they made some more changes to the issue. And then the last flat plate issue was produced in 1914. We'll take a look at a lot of these changes a little bit more in detail as we go. The 1908 issue was hand assembled and it took 17 workers to produce a coil roll. Very time consuming and costly. Here's the imperforate set. You have your vertical and horizontal coils. The three cent horizontal coil in the bottom right is probably the rarest of the entire group. There's only one certified example known. The perforated varieties in vertical format. This is an example of the imperforate five cent used on a cover to Germany. And here are the horizontal examples. This 
This is one of six covers known with the 10 cent coil from the first issue. And the rarity and difficulty of acquisition in the past 40 years or so, each of the six covers have sold one time. So it's a very difficult example to find on cover. For the coil production, it was made from sheet stamps. So we have a paint of 400 and they had what they call two millimeter spacing between the stamp designs. The 4000 series number on the tab for the paste up is from the first sheets or first plates that were used to produce the coils. They basically named these by the imprints that were put in the margins. And this is basically a layout of a 400 subject pane. Here we have an imperforate and a perforated example. 4,000 series are from the imprint plates. Here is a plate proof, which will show the imprint. And it basically just has the bureau engraving and printing along with the plate number. This changes from one of the from one, one issue to the next. And you will see the different examples. The horizontal spacing between designs is the only thing that was adjusted. So the first plates were two millimeters. They printed the first issue on double line watermark. These are the actual size of the letters. And here are a few examples of the paper as far as printing varieties. Uh, we have a pre-printing paper fold on the left. And the example on the right, it shows the back of the stamp where it's highlighted. And there's actually no gum in that area. So it was like a post-printing paper fold. So it's kind of unusual in that aspect as a variety. In the early coil construction, they would take it and put it through a foot pedaled perforator. Depending on the format of the coil, whether it was vertical or horizontal, the sheet was perforated vertically or horizontally. As, as it was perforated, the sheet was slipped by a cutting wheel into two sheets of 200. Then the two sheets were cut into panes of 100. Then they slit the panes of 100 into 10 strips. And these were all pasted together. So it was a very time consuming process. This particular example is a paste up strip of four. The paste up is at the top. And here's an enlargement. And you'll notice the top stamp actually has a vertical and a horizontal guideline, which means it basically came from the center of the pain of 400. But usually you don't see this as far as part of the paste up. This shows it was an early paste up where they were pasting together strips of 10. Later, the Bureau installed what was a new machine called the stripper. It slit the pain of 400 into 20 strips with 20 coil stamps. The machine was actually a perforating machine that had cutting wheels installed in place of the perforating wheels. This production process was modified with the addition of this new machine. So instead of strips of 10, now they had strips of 20 that they pasted together by hand. So again, as an outline, uh, the paint of foreigner was passed through the perforating machine. It was perforated in one direction, depending on the format of the coil. If vertical coils were being made, the bottom of the sheet was trimmed off at the frame line of the design. The top of the pane was slightly reduced to a quarter inch. The pane was then taken to the stripping machine where it was cut into 20 strips. At this point, the strips were pasted together by hand. Here's kind of a diagram to show how the process worked. You notice that the left stamp has the tab on the margin on the right hand side and the right stamp has been cut off near the frame line. And what they would do is they would paste the one strip over the top of the other. So as you can see, it would be a very time consuming process. Their alignment was not always great, as you can see. And what they would do in this case was if it was way out of alignment, they would hand trim with a pair of scissors to even up the coil edges. 
so that when they rolled the coil up, it would be evenly put together. Here are a few other examples where they had to trim at the paste up. They have what we call as a reverse paste up. They change the production process. Instead, the tab is on the left side of the pane instead of the right. Here are a few examples of the reverse paste up. The one cent, we have a plate number and you'll see the tab is clearly on the left instead of the right hand side. The 10 cent value, the majority, not all of them, but the majority of them that are found with paste ups are done in this manner. So I'm not sure if the person working at the bureau was either left or right handed and they did the process backwards compared to the rest of the rest of the stamps. Here is an example that's on postcard and we have an enlargement in the bottom right hand corner where we can see how the tab was underneath the right edge of the stamp. Being perforated 12, the paper was very brittle and a lot of times it would break. Well, this is an unusual variety because it's actually had two splice repairs done to it, as you can see from the bottom. And the splice repairs were done with a pair of, with that basically kind of a craft paper that was perforated and rejoined, putting the stamps back together. The left-hand side of the strip, you notice there's quite a bit of red ink and it's actually kind of like a thumbprint from the bureau worker putting it back together when the ink was still wet. Here we have an example of a splice repair done with perforated stamp paper. Notice that the color is a little bit different. It's much brighter and white. Here's uh, something that I've been working on as far as a new, new uh, investigation. I found that on some of the paste ups with the hand assembled, there are basically uh, pin holes that are found right along the guideline and arrow markings. And having shown this to a number of dealers and a number of collectors, nobody really can explain what exactly is causing that pin, perforating pin to be made in the paper. But it's something I've been working on trying to find some more information about and hopefully at some point you can get some pictures and get into the Bureau of Engraving and investigate that a bit further. Basically, when the full sheet of 400 was put on the stripping table, I believe what has happened is that they uh, used something to hold down the entire pane while it was pushed through and cut. And I think this is what might have put the pinholes in the top and the bottom of the sheet. Here's another example that was found. I will note that the only time I have found this production marking or production variety has been on the guideline and arrows for paste ups. It's ne I've never found it on any other paste up. In the one cent strip, you basically look at the top pair, it's from the bottom of the, the sheet and the bottom stamp is from the top of the sheet. What I believe is some type of a clamp held the sheet in place while it was cut. Here is kind of a visual diagram of the plate. And the highlighted areas show where the paste up parts of the strip of four come from. So in the early stages of producing the first coil stamps, a problem was discovered. It was found that when the stamps were printed, the paper shrank unevenly. This caused many stamps to be off center and were of poor quality when perforated. So to correct the problem, the Bureau designed a new plate with different spacing. Their new plate was called the star plate. And what they did was they added a little star to the imprint and they changed the number to 5,000 series. In this particular plate, they had a variety of spacing. 
In the center eight rows, they spaced the subjects at two millimeters. And the outer six rows, they spaced at three millimeters. The entire process and change in the plate setup was done to help solve the problem with the shrinkage of the paper. Here's another part of a, of a plate proof showing the two and three millimeter spacing. An interesting production variety is that when they were making the, the plate, they took the die of the one cent die and they rolled it into the plate for the two cent stamps by mistake. And then the worker tried to erase the lines from the one cent die. This has been reported on a number of different uh, Scott varieties of two cent values. And you'll notice the red arrows are kind of highlighting some of the extra lines that are from the one cent design. If we look at a complete strip, the foreign entry is always found on the fourth stamp down from the plate number. Here they show an overlay. If we take the two cent design and lay it over the one cent, you can see where some of the lines of the one cent in the words and letters still show up on the two cent stamp. Two cent. Very interesting variety. So in 1910, they came up with another issue. Again, they were not announced by the Bureau and collectors found these new varieties by chance after they were released to the public. These are the imperforate varieties. The big change is they went to single line watermark. They still were on the imperforate and perforated gauge 12 perforations. Here's an example of a imperf horizontal coil. I found that the imperforate coils, many of them are very difficult to find on cover, particularly the horizontal ones. As far as I know, this is one of two documented uses of the horizontal coil. Then we have the perforated varieties. The big rarity the Orangeburg coil exists basically because Bell and Company were able to make a request and have a special order fulfilled for them to make coil stamps. They also, a lot of people don't realize this, they also were responsible for the 10 cent issue that came out in the 1908 issue. That was also a special order. And they used both of these stamps on their mailings and this is probably one of the most notable coils in the entire series because of its history. Here we have one on cover. And most of these stamps, if you've ever looked at descriptions when they're sold in auction, they have a certain amount of faults to them. Well, the culprit are those little metal tins that are scanned to size and they would put three or four of those in the envelope and send them out to the pharmacists or doctors. And they put their antacid pills inside them. And basically they put these stamps and envelopes through canceling machine. And that's why many of the stamps become damaged. So they changed from single to single line watermark to strengthen the paper. During this issue, they also came up with a new process called the auto wound process. What they did find was the PERF 12 coils could not hold up due to the tension of the coiling machine. This is the reason why the next perforation gauge was changed to 8.5 for the next issue. This particular coil issue had a very short time span. We have a production variety in this example, the left pair has what we call regular orientation of the letters when you view from the back of the stamps. And the right pair has a reverse orientation. So when they were putting the paper in the printing part, somebody put the paper in one side up and then they changed it and put it in. And somehow or another, these two pairs got put together in the same paste up strip before. 
you can see the single line watermark letters are much smaller than the double line. And they present a lot more problems as far as trying to find them when you're looking for the watermark to detect. You have a pre-printing paper fold. Yeah. Not very common with coils. The Audubon process had some major changes. It involved taking the pane of 400 and cutting it in half. And then the panes of 200 were pasted together. This process was continued until there were 500 or 1,000 stamps in a roll. Then they would attach a piece of craft paper to the beginning and end of the roll. And then the roll was then put on an auto wound coiler where it was cut into 10 ribbons and wound into coils. Here we have an example uh, of a later Stickney auto wound coiler. But as you can see, there's a big roll that's there and as they go through, the roll is slit and then they're wound into the 10 different coils that are being wound on spools. They also, on the imperf, on the leader strips, they will put auto wound to identify that as a process for how they were produced. As you can see, the craft paper edges match the parallel edges of the coil. This is a production characteristic of the auto on coils. Ooh, with all this junk. Here we have a 388 pair with the leader. Again, it shows the auto on process being printed to identify how it was produced. So due to the Perf 12 coils being too brittle and they frequently broke, the gauge was changed to 8.5 for the new 1910 issue. Stronger paper solved the breakage problem. The star plates were not successful in solving the spacing problem. One of the byproducts from this 1910 issue is something that they call coil waste. The varied spacing created a problem for a lot of private vending machine companies. They could not adjust their perforating pins to the varied spacing on the sheet. So one company, and here's some examples of the flat plate coil waste. These are some of the plate numbers that have been reported. In 2012, there were only three documented pieces. Now we're up to, I think, 12 or 13 that I've been able to document. So for the US AV private vending machine company, what they did to correct the problem was they cut the center rate rows out of the 400 subject pane. And then they sold them the centerpiece, which was eight by 20. This is some examples of the US AV corporation. And this is the top of the piece where they cut out the center eight rows. Somebody might recognize this. It's the largest used example. And up to uh, this past year, none of this was ever found actually used on cover. The Coil stamps, uh, coil waste stamps were actually sold at the post office in Washington, D.C. up to the early 1920s. So Edward Warden is known to have used a lot of different stamps to send out. And this is an example of a piece from the flat plate coil waste. Late use, but nonetheless, it's the only one that's been found as far as a use of that particular coil waste. So what the Bureau did was they took the remaining outside pieces and perforated them and created panes of 60. The panes of 60 have been reported from all four corners. Soon after the Bureau created the new A plates for the 1910 perf 8.5 issues. Here are two examples of the pane of 60, one from the upper left and one from the bottom right.
there was a transition and this has been some personal study and research on my part where I found that in some of the imperforate coils, I've been able to find spacing varieties for the line pairs. The top strip of eight has the two millimeter spacing and the bottom strip of four has the wider 2.75 millimeter spacing, which shows the transition from the star plate to the A plate. Here's a cover that I found where the top strip of four has the wider spacing for the, the guideline. And then I enlarged the bottom pair and I have an arrow pointing and you can kind of see the bottom part of the letter A at the paste up, which shows that this is from the actual A plate instead of the star plate. Somebody also wrote on the cover when they noticed this variety. So in 1910, they came out with the next issue, which was perforated 8.5. Here's an example of the perf eight and a half coil that Bell and Company sent out, but this one went to Canada. So it was an unusually treaty rate use for fourth class mail. So in 1910, the new plate was designed. They call it the A plate. This had a consistent horizontal spacing of 2.75 between stamp designs. It was used for the one, two, and five cent issues. Again, as we said earlier, the Bureau did a lot of experimenting and they made all these changes without really making any announcements whatsoever. And they were found years later. Here's an example of a plate proof showing the spacing and the imprint. So they had the Bureau of Engraving and Printing with the letter A and then the 5000 series plate number also showed the approval date for this plate proof. Here is a reconstructed plate uh, showing the imprint with some vertical coils. The five cent, for some reason, it was only the letter A and the plate number. They dropped the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. I'm not sure what the reason was, but they didn't use it for the five cent value. Now for the three and the four cent issues, they continue to be printed on the old star plates. And I'm going to speculate that the reason is that the demand for these stamps was not as great as the one and two cent values. This is also a reconstructed imprint showing the Bureau of Engraving star and the plate numbers. They had a third plate. They weren't happy, so they kept changing things. So they came up with the same spacing as the A plate, but they dropped the Bureau of Engraving imprint in the letter A and they only have the plate number. Again, they changed to the 6,000 series plate number. So that's one way you can identify which plate that the coil stamp came from is by the number. The four cent value is one of three reported and they're very difficult to find. So in 1910, with changing their production methods, they again followed through with the Ottawa process. They cut the 400 subject panes into two smaller panes of 200. They trimmed off the left margin. The two sheets were then pasted together. And again, the larger rolls were then placed on a sewing machine. So the Ottawa process sped up and reduced the number of workers from 17 to two which saved them a lot of time and labor. Here's an example of the plate. And what they do is they cut it in half. The pace ups for this are always evenly aligned if you look at the top and bottom edges, not like the hand assembled. Sometimes they wouldn't quite align them perfectly and you would get what they call a step. Here's an example. This would be from the outer edges of the sheet. So they didn't always line up just perfectly, but you'll notice that the edges are always parallel to each other. Now this particular issue created collector interest. It was only produced in coil format with 8.5 gauge perforations. 
So they finally recognized coils as a new area to collect. It also created an interest in the first coils. Moving on to the next issue in 1912, they made a few subtle changes. Here's a nice example of the horizontal coil being forwarded not once but twice and then returned finally to sender. So it made its way to the Philippines, went from the Philippines to Italy, and then ended up back in Springfield, Mass. Here are the same imperforate issues. And this particular guideline pair was actually sent from Veracruz. Major changes. The one and two cent denominations now included numerals to conform to the UPU regulations. So in the 1910 example on the left, you'll see that the denomination is out, printed out in words. And the 1912 issue, they used numerals and words for the denominations. There also was a change in who was on the one cent stamp from the beginning of production back in the earlier mid 1800s, Franklin was always on the one cent denomination. And in 1912, they decided to change that and tried to make it a little bit more uniform so there wouldn't be any confusion in the designs. Now for the vertical coils, they ran into a problem. There was a spacing problem. And what they had to do to correct that was they had made the center row between the 10th and 11, 11th vertical rows on the plate, one centimeter. What this did was it provided enough margin for every vertical coil roll, row to be the same width when the coils were slit. For this special plate, they put the imprint coil stamps in the margins. And this was to alert the employees of the new plate being used for vertical coils. Here's an example of what I meant about how the vertical coils were a little bit narrower in the 10th and 11th row. The craft paper is the correct width of what all the stamps are normally cut at. This one is actually a little bit, the stamp as you can see is a little bit narrower than the craft paper. So for the new vertical design, they put one centimeter spacing in the middle and you can see the world word coil stamps in the margin. Now this particular example was extremely off center. And as you can see, you can see the plate number in the margin on the right hand side. This is very unusual because normally they are not slit or cut this far off and many times the margins are cut off and you never see plate numbers for the vertical coils. This is one of two examples that are documented. Here is a plate layout, uh, coil stamps pane, and this is from the upper left. In the upper left and the lower right, they only put the plate number in the margin. They put the imprint coil stamps in the bottom left and the upper right corner of the plate. The complete panes of 100 are pretty scarce. This is one of three recorded examples from the upper left. There are no known examples of the two cent value and there are none known from the bottom right. Here's an example showing the imprint on a full pane of 100. This is the lower left quadrant of the foreigner subject pane. And this is the enlarged area at the very bottom of that pane. And you'll see the engraving on two of the stamps. This was kind of a guideline for lining up the half sheets for the paste up process. And of course, the big problem with the perf eight and a half coils is they were difficult to separate, as you can see with the stamp on the left. So the gauge was changed to 10 for the next issue in 1914. Here we have the 1914 issue. The 
perforation, as we said, was changed from gauge eight and a half to 10. They found that this was the best gauge for easily separating the stamps. They also added an extra cutting wheel and it trimmed off the excess outside margin and that removed the step from all the paste ups. So they eliminated that particular excess. Now the coil stamps plates did not have plate numbers at the top or bottom as you would normally find on a uh, full pane of 400. And some enterprising person decided to try and take a vertical coil that was not printed on the coil stamps plates and make it into a coil. And this is a actual forgery of an imperf coil. In 1914, the issue was printed on the provisional plates. All other plates had been retired from use. And basically the key reason for only using the plate number was that there were no other plates that were in use. So they didn't feel they needed to have the Bureau of Engraving imprint and the star or letter A or anything else for that matter. In this example, we have the vertical coil. Uh, it's actually at earliest known use with a pre-cancel. One of my favorite examples was postcard sent in a glassine envelope. You'll notice that on the right-hand side, I show an enlargement of the back and the wishbone around the turkey has glitter on it. So due to regulations, they had to put the postcard in a glassine and they charge it the two cent letter rate because of the attachment to the postcard. The three cent value is very difficult. There are probably a half a dozen examples known. This is one of two registered uses and it's the only one going to a country outside the United States. We have the four cent value. If you look at the left edge of the three stamps, you'll notice that there's a tear in them. And the affixing machine actually had an advancing pin that would move the coil roll and make an indentation in the stamps as they applied and affixed them to the letter. The last flat plate coil produced the five cent value and one of the most difficult to find used in period this, there are two solo uses known. This is a, and we'll talk about postal history, a commercial use, not philatelically inclined in this case. And it's one of the more difficult examples to find. Now to kind of wind things up, the Bureau was changing and going through the transition process from flat plate printing to rotary press printing. And they had produced all of the vertical coils and had an excessive number left over in sheets. And instead of just disposing of them, they decided to perforate them horizontally and sell them as sheet stamps. And they put them on sale in Washington, DC on August 2nd, 1915. And this particular person sent a nice example over to Germany. We have a enlargement or reduced enlargement or reduced color copy, I should say, of the front of the envelope. So we have 10 cents for the registration and five cents for the first class UPU rate. And in conclusion, we go to what was the first rotary press issue. It's an early do earliest documented use of the two cent type one 453. There also was an imperforate rotary press coil produced at this time, which is the same exact design. And that was Scott 459. And that's my conclusion. Thank you, Greg. Hopefully I, I tried to move along. It was a lot of information. <laughs> Great, and I think uh, we have some time so we can open it up to some questions. If anyone- I have a uh, comment. 
Yeah, go ahead, Larry. The, the one, the one cover that was addressed to Emily King. Yes, she was. She was a prolific Canadian first aid cover servicer in the early days of Canadian first aid covers in okay. the nineteen twenties. She was fantastic. She was yeah. uh, way above her uh, ahead of her time. Does anybody else have a, a question or a comment for Greg? Fantastic collection. Yeah, Greg. Yeah. Thanks for the credit. Great program. Greg. All right. <laughs> I thought you might recognize a Beautiful few things, movie. Jerry. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> I even gave you credit. <laughs> yes. And I thank you for it. Yes. Well, it's, you know, <laughs> very, very nice piece. But uh, yeah, that's I, now I, what I, have a, I have a question. Hello? Yes. Yeah, I had a question, but I, it took me a minute to get my system back up because I had to shut off the camera. Sure. Um, but I did want to ask about private vending coils and where they fit into this whole flow of things. For example, I know most of the time they worked with imperfect stamps and then they did their own perforation or separation method. Yeah. But were there ever any times where they adopted government coils and and just use them in well, their fixing machines. Ba basically what they, and Jerry can correct me if I'm wrong, but basically they had an agreement. The Bureau would sell the vending machine companies, the full imperforate sheets, uncut, unperforated. And then they would make and put them through their own process to develop the coils. So they basically did everything on their own as far as the different varieties. And that's, and, and the key word there is he said private. You know, not government issued, and so the the private companies had uh, numerous varieties, and those actually, you know, kind of, you know, paralleled what I was doing. But the ones that I've shown in the presentation are all government bureau issued examples. Right. Yeah, it's a whole different is world it? to get into with those. <laughs> oh yeah. Is there, do you ever go back and forth in an exhibit or anything where you're showing first what the government was doing and then how that was treated by private companies, that kind of thing? Um, I did do a single frame on the flat plate coil waste, the first issues that I showed. They had the big imperforate pieces and then the panes of 60. And right. what I actually was able to do was I got a scan from... Uh, the archives of a full plate proof. So it was a 400 subject plate proof, two size. And I printed that out. And then I overlaid the pieces as far as where they went on the sheet of 400. And then the exhibit, that was basically the center of the exhibit frame. And then around the outside, I put the pages that showed the different issues that were you know, involved with that. And I did include, like I showed the one USAV cover and uh, the stamps, the USAV cover actually has a horizontal paste up on it. And there's only like four of those that are known. They're not real, real common. So that was, uh, it's just, it's a very labor intensive setup though. <laughs> you know, to put that all together in a frame. It's not something I would ever send to a show and ask somebody else to do. But I did, I did show it one time and it was like, well, pre COVID the last Garfield Perry show. And uh, they were quite, uh, surprised with that stuff but that's just one of the interesting varieties from that stuff of all the different experimenting that they did and the byproducts um, Wallace Cleland was looking for that particular issue uh, for a long time and then Ken Lawrence pointed out that in the Miller collection there was a piece it's, I believe it's a plate block of 10 and then he found a plate block of 16 from the top and then shortly before he passed, there was another piece that was found. But uh, since then, I've done more digging and more researching. And I've actually found, uh, of all places, pieces on eBay where they sell them as imperfect plate blocks. And they have no idea that it's a very rare coil variety. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, I see the Emily King cover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, 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 she was uh, unbelievable because she, like I said, this is 27. But the, yeah. the, the early era of, uh, they didn't even know what first days were. No, no. And actually, uh, Tim alluded to, they didn't really have any first day issues for the Washington Franklins. 
Well, there was actually one, and it was the very last rotary press stamp was the 497, the 10 cent issue. That's the only one that actually had a first day of issue uh, that was actually recognized. The rest of them, uh, you know, the collectors of this particular material will chase what they call earliest documented uses. Uh, there used to be a collector, Alan Birkin, who had an entire exhibit on all the different, you know, earliest documented uses for coils, sheet stamps, imperforate stamps, booklets, all that stuff. And uh, it's always interesting. And it's kind of, kind of playing Russian roulette when you look for those because somebody could find one that's a day earlier. And now your cover is not worth that much. <laughs> That happens with 19th century material as well. They look for yeah. EDUs on those. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You play, as I say, you're playing with fire, but you know, when you can find them, um, you know, for inexpensive prices, I mean, uh, there were a few examples that I bought the cover for the stamp, not for the, not for the day of use, just to fill, you know, an example in the exhibit. So hopefully, Hopefully, if uh, Tim's still there, I may get to show my A-frame exhibit in Chicago <laughs> this fall. Yeah. Take it. I've only had I'm one other teacher. opportunity. I've only had one other opportunity to show the new format, which I took the imperforate coils and the perforated varieties of all the flat plate material and put it into an A-frame exhibit. Uh, I showed it one time at Sarasota in 19 or 2019. And then, of course, after that, everything... <laughs> kind of went to pot and we weren't able to show much. So haven't shown it much since then, but I've been able to add some interesting material to it. Good. Well, our applications are, you know, are available. <laughs> so uh, go on our website. I, right. I expect to see one. Yes. Yeah, I think Tim is there hiding somewhere. <laughs> actually, um, Tim, are you Tim actually had are some. You oh, he is, he's gone. He's on, but not there. Who's, who's coordinating team formation? It's up to you. Oh, each individual, huh? Yeah, each individual, or you get together with people. Oh, the, the, key, okay. the, the, key, the key thing, the key thing from what, because I've been involved with it before, the key thing is if you can get a first time exhibit that's never been shown at a national show. And, you know, and, and that, that's the key thing. And it also adds bonus points if you have exhibits from different categories, such as postal history, uh, you know, and all the different varieties of types of exhibits uh, that you can have. And then they get bonus points, like if it gets a special award, if it wins a reserve grand in the show, if it wins the grand, it gets more bonus points. And then they total them all up for, you know, the teams. So it, do, it does make for an, for an interesting you know, show, and I think the very the very first time they did a single frame uh, show uh, for the team competition was in Toronto, Canada. And that's been several years back. And actually next year in the summer, if you have seen the announcement, they will have the first international single frame show where they expect to have 400 single frames. Oh my God, I hate to be a judge for that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I would imagine they'll have lots of judges for that. Based on the, I should hope so. Yeah, Greg, yeah. I've got a question. This is Eric. I have a question that came out of the chat from Keith, and he was asking, did they ever make an imperfect example that was not designed for coils? So, Keith, if you could unmute yourself, you might expand on that question. Well, um, I'm just wondering if there were any sheets that were or, uh, panes that had uh, the imperf variety that were uh, sold over the counter as uh, uh, imperf stamps. There, there are, there are uh, just regular imperfs. There were examples that can be found. Um, you know, they're listed in the Scots catalog. Uh, the first imperfs you know, for the Washington Franklin area, it started around 343, and they go up to 347. Uh, what they, was they the difference do, they, between them and the coils? Well, the coils went through an actual process where they took the imperf sheet, and then they put it through the machine that cut the sheet into, you know, ribbons. 
So how did and, you know that that one big that big uh, pain you had that was the biggest usage? Yes. Uh, that it was coil as opposed to imperf. Oh, the one cent, the 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 large. That was yeah. what they call basically what that is coil waste and really to define that, they say coil waste is basically um, stamp material that was intended for coil production that was produced into sheet stamps. So you can have an imperforate sheet stamp, you can have a, you can have a perforated sheet stamp, and the intention of that when they cut the center eight rows out of the paint of 400 was that the private vending machine company was going to put turn that into their private vending machine coils. And because of all the changes and they happened so fast, from 19 in 1910 they went from one issue to the next, and they changed the plate layout. So they went from the star plate in 1910 to the A plate in 1910. Well, the star plate had the varied spacing and they only could use the center eight rows. The A plate was consistent. The entire pane was 2.75 millimeters. So they kind of solved their problem. And the reason that these things were sold at the post office in Washington DC is that the USAV company had no use for them now because they could get a full pane of 400. Why mess around with a pane of 200 when you could use the entire 400 pane? So the, instead of throwing them out, the Bureau took them to the post office in Washington, D.C., and they sold them over the counter up to the early 1920s. And they basically were used as sheet stamps. And the example I showed on the cover that was done by Warden, uh, he was very prolific you know, in using stamps and sending them out for different uses and uh, so forth. Well, now you dated that back to 1910. Actually, in 1908, they were already doing imperfect coils and that sort of thing, but that was just regular sheet material, wasn't it? Yeah, they didn't, didn't, they didn't do anything for the vending machine companies then. It wasn't until the single yeah. line watermark in 1910 was when they made that, they tried to make that accommodation for the vending machine company. But they did have private vending coils they already did. back then. The oh Sharmax. yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. They they had their you know they had their private vending machine coils back then as well. The very the very first sheet, or excuse me, the very first plate they used to produce the coils was the uh, imprint plate, which had a consistent two millimeter spacing. It was when they made that star plate that messed up the private vending machine companies. Now they that didn't work too well for them. So then when they went from the star plate to the A plate, that helped them. You know, and then they didn't have to worry about trying to adjust their perforating pins. So all the all the experimentation created a lot of varieties and a lot of unusual, you know, material to collect. Nice. Where's Tim? Um, Tim is actually uh, uh, had to leave early. Has left the uh, building. Has left the <laughs> building. Does anybody have any more uh, questions for uh, Greg? Nope. I think that's it. Mm. Great stuff. Okay. In that case, um, oh, one more. Go, go right ahead. I want to ask a novice question. Okay. Why is there an ink impression on the flight, flat plate stamps? On the back side. On the back, um, yeah. when the when the stamps were printed, it was a, a fairly quick process. They would put the paper and have it printed, and they pull it off and they make a stack. And the ink was still wet to a certain degree. So of course, from all the pressure, you get a transfer of the ink to the back of the uh, you know previous sheet, and that's kind of a characteristic of flat plate stamps is that you'll see that on a lot of them. Rotary press, you don't see the transfer of the ink to the back unless it was a mistake, pretty much. But that that's the reason why they, you'll see ink on the back of a lot of the flat plate material is, is because they stacked one sheet on top of the other when the ink was still wet. I believe that's right, Jerry. Yep, or partially <laughs> wet, but yeah. Yeah. They were on question. gummed or gummed? Uh, I, be I, gummed? I, believe, I believe they were gummed after. Yeah, these were still yeah. just after printing. Gumming was later. Yeah, the the rot the rotary press machine was quite an invention because 
if I have it correct, they were able to go from printing 1 million stamps per day to 6 million when they put that new machine into, into play. So they were able to meet the demands, you know, a lot faster. Printing stamps by the mile, they called it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very, yeah, some of the pictures with the big roll of paper, there's a lot of interesting varieties there as well. So I'm going to look forward to seeing it at the Chicago PEX, your exhibit. Should be good. Yep. Yeah, I think you can definitely get in touch with uh, Tim if, if, if you want to exhibit. Uh, uh, I'll have to, I'll have to oh, one thing I didn't remember, I'll have to check because I was supposed to be part of a, a team with Rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we're definitely pushing the, the, the teams. Yep. So that yeah, and if, that, if that's the case and that works out, then that's part of what my eight frame exhibit is. So I might not be able to show that. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be able to show, I have a single frame that is all on the imperf coils in the, in the different varieties and uses, which is, has not been shown yet at a, at a national show. So I've been holding out on that one. <laughs> Great. Well, on behalf, on behalf of uh, Tim Waite, our program chair, I'd like to thank you very much, Greg, uh, for your presentation this evening. It was fantastic. You're welcome. Yep. A little applause. I know, and a lot of information. <laughs> Yep. We really, really do appreciate you uh, sharing your uh, incredible knowledge with us. And um, let's see, I think most every, a lot of folks have left. Um, I can stay on the call uh, for a little while uh, if folks want to chat. Oh, Larry's still here. Hi, Larry. Um, mm -hmm. If folks still want to chat, if anyone has any more questions specifically for Greg, we'll take those first. Uh, but uh, we got a couple. Couple, two, three more minutes here if people want to hang out. Yeah, I can show I can show Jerry one of my new pieces. <laughs> if that shows hey. up. Well, we gotta get closer. Yeah. It's oh, okay. all imperf vertical coils. There you go. Oh, okay. you there? Yeah. Big okay. multiple. Father McKenzie's still there? Yeah. That was one, and then we have a combination of two. Ah, there you go. 1910 oh, and 1912. Ah. Combination. Oh, no. So got a, got a few, few new interesting things. We'll see what happens. Yep. Nice background, too, by the way. Oh, that's <laughs> my kind of accumulation. <laughs> Just a few ribbons. <laughs> Although... Although, as, as, as my friend, or Mick Hadley always calls me, he says, I'm very lucky in finding stuff. And here was, here was a piece that I showed him, and he's like, where'd you find that? And I said, it was on eBay. Oh, yes. And it's a 355. It's got a paste up at the end. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Nobody really knew what it was. So it's one of those things you keep looking, and you never know what you find. Right. Surfing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Your awards uh, in the background uh, there, Greg, uh, remind me of our former club president, uh, Ruben Ben Ramkasun, who uh, oh. sometimes would ask, you know, one would ask, oh, what do you collect? And he would essentially say, awards. <laughs> <laughs> I know somebody uh, that he takes all the, if he, if he wins a grand or reserve grand, he puts them on the Christmas tree for decorations. <laughs> <laughs> I told that to my wife and she said, don't even think about it. And I said, nope, they're staying in the basement. Set up a second tree. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I said, we don't need to see those. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Greg. Thanks very much. I'm going to take I, off. We'll I see thank you. you very much for letting me share my information. <laughs>